It's my particular pleasure to welcome uh, today's speaker, um, Professor Rosario Isazi, who is a long time uh, colleague and friend of the HELAC Center and has worked with us in a number of projects. Um, so Professor Isazi is the Research Associate Professor of Human Genetics at the, the uh, Dr. John T. McDonald Foundation Department of Human Genetics within the University of Miami Miller School of Medicine. And also adjunct professor of law at the University of Miami School of Law and has a number of other appointments. Um, professor Azati has um, research covers really a lot of what we might think of as kind of ethical, legal, social, policy dimensions of novel technologies. And this would include things like genetic technologies and biobanks, uh, stem cells and regenerative medicine, and also some of the data protection issues associated with those things. So um, it's, it's a very broad uh, palette, but I know from my own experience of, of uh, reading Professor Asasi's work and obviously speaking with her, that um, it's always extremely in depth and, and prescient and really brings out a lot of the key issues. So without further ado, I'm going to hand you over to Professor Asasi, who is going to talk today about some of the LC issues in and governance issues in the US Precision Medicine Program, which is known as the All of Us Project. Thank you. I just want to confirm that everybody can see my screen. Fantastic. Uh, well, first of all, thank you so much for the invitation. It's, it's a true pleasure uh, to be back reconnecting uh, with the Helix Center, as, as Michael said, longtime colleagues, but also friends. Uh, and that is the beauty of, of this virtual world we live in. I'm gonna take you uh, with an overview of a very interesting uh, project in the US, the All of Us Research Initiative. Um, I just have some disclaimers here, and my affiliation with the All of Us as an MPI in, the con uh, in a consortium is one of the health providers organizations, and, and also in the governance of the All of Us. But of course, these views are, the views I'm gonna experience are in my own. The All of Us Research Program is, the largest cohort, longitudinal cohort in the U in U.S. history uh, is impressive. It started uh, in around 2015 uh, by President Obama, who launched the Precision Medicine Initiative with a three billion dollars project. The All of Us seeks to enroll over a million, uh, or at least a million, research uh, participants of very diverse background. I would say that and the idea is to accelerate biomedical research and improve health. But the ethos of the program, what it makes it so unique is diversity. Diversity understood at different divisions, uh, dimensions at a scale. One is about the type of resources available, very rich resources about clinical, environmental, lifestyle, genetic data, and others. Uh, the longitudinal basis that we aim to go over 60 years, but also diversity of participants. And I'm gonna talk about this uh, at length uh, later. But now I will say that the diversity of participants is re reflected in broad diversity. The, I'm sorry, it aims to reflect the broad diversity of the population of the US. So it doesn't matter the age, the race, the ethnicity, the gender, the socioeconomic status, the geography, or the health status. But the purpose also the program is to over recruit or over represent individuals that have been historical and represented biomedical research. In short, what we mean to recruit uh, or now can be recruited is anybody who can consent to participate in research, who have the capacity, and who is a resident of the US. And by resident, I don't mean a legal resident, but it's somebody who is habitated in the US. But also the program has diversity of researchers. The idea is to build tools and capabilities that can make it easy for a broad range of researchers to make discovery using the data and the samples in the cohorts. Another interesting dimension of the All of Us is that 
it will, the resources will be also available for citizen scientists. So we are expanding diversity beyond traditional researchers. The program also rests on core values. First and foremost, it's a participatory research program. Participatory understood that uh, individuals that are part of the program are partners. And we have walked the walk at the all of us. Since the program was conceptualized, since inception, participants have been part of creating the structure of the program and continues to be involved not only in shaping policy on a daily basis organically, but also they are part of the governance structure. Related to this participatory approach is the participation is very democratic, as I mentioned before, open to all. The uh, return of value is another aspect that characterizes the values of the program, meaning that participants will have access to their information, but also they could benefit for the discoveries by providing data uh, broadly accessible for research purposes. The program as such aims to be a catalyst for positive change in research with a strong savers for privacy and security. And importantly, the program aims to earn trust. But why? Why do the, a program like the All of Us is important? Uh, it might not be a surprise to you that like a diversity in clinical trials have been broadly documented, but this is more stark in the US. Uh, the majority of genomic studies have been conducted in populations that not reflect the US population. The majority uh, of European uh, ancestries, but also uh, there was not uh, populations with different ages or uh, incomes or gender orientations. So the all of us aims to respond to this need to improve the database available for researchers. And here I have a graphic of where the all of us is now um, in terms of individuals and the representative medical research. Look at this high percentage, 80%, no white or Hispanic Latinos, we are at 50%, and then you will see the different categories. So all of us is not reflected of the majority of the studies. This is a snapshot of where the program is as of February uh, of this year. And we are halfway, uh, uh, close to halfway of the initial tax, uh, goal of a million uh, individuals or participants, which now we are gonna expand. And then you can see also how the participants have completed different steps of the program. You can see also how COVID had an impact on the program, but it is still, uh, participation was possible. How, and when I say we, I mean not only the program, I don't represent the program, but the partners um, uh, as a participant in the program, as a principal investigator in one of the awardees. This is a really hard task, but we are okay with that. We come with the need, as I said before, to diversify. Uh, the population represented in research. A good colleague of mine, uh, Patricia King, and a prominent bioethicist and, and, and doctor, had a wonderful quote that said, the past is the prologue, and nothing more accurate or I mean, to the task of the all of us in this overrepresenting bionic research, uh, um, underrepresented minorities. And this is because there is this legacy of having individuals that have not only have not been part of research studies, but when they were, they were taken advantage, they were abused, and in an adult so distant past, uh, some of the photos here, and you might be familiar with Henrietta Lacks, uh, the Tuskegee and the Guatemala syphilis, uh, syphilis trials, where they have Sup Supai tribe, the inmates in the US that were subject to dioxin experiments, and others, these populations and their descendants are legitimately worried about participating in biomedical research, about donating data for such uses or samples. So the first and foremost steps is to rebuild trust. 
How do we do this? Let me take you through the participant journey. And as I said before, the All of Us is a rich program. It's kind of complex. So bear with me as I walk you through different aspects of the program that I would like you to highlight to give you a the doesn't fit uh, view of the program. First, we have um, the program has a dynamic consent via electronic informed consent models. This model is one where we call the basic consent, so the consent to participate in, in research in the program, to join the program. The second step or the second model is to authorize to share electronic health records, uh, but also and the one that triggers lately the, the more, I would say, socioethical and legal implications and scientific as well, is the consent to participate in genomic research, but also to receive DNA result studies. Uh, is, uh, results. Uh, what type of results? Some of them are traits, uh, what we will call fun traits. Uh, do you have the gene or enzyme that predisposes you for bitter taste or for hate cilantro or too much earwax? But also research about your genetic ancestry. And now we're working and implementing at the program polygenic risk scores and very interesting and important clinical actionable medical research or gen genomic research. And we will follow um, the list of provided by the American College of Medical Geneticists. I don't know if you're familiar with it, over 55 actionable, medical actionable genes, pathology genes. And as I said, these are dynamic consent where the participants not only can change their authorization during the process, they can also pause their participation in the program and come back whatever they feel appropriate, but also, of course, they can withdraw from the program. In terms of the consent to receive and, and be offered DNA results uh, in this last of the program is participants have first two category of choices, sir, yes, sir, no, but also they can say, I'm not sure right now, and through the, the, their part, lifelong participation in the pro, on the program, they can change their preference at any time. There's a very uh, safe, I will say, or at least uh, process for returning this information and safe in terms of there's a number of safeguards that have been um, established by the program. Once the participants have consented uh, to share the electronic record, participants would also uh, join a number of surveys. Uh, another core of the program is retention. We This is a not, it's participatory research, it's dynamic consent, but also because it's longitudinal study. The program is to have participants truly engage in the program through their life. And that means that there will be constant surveys or um, including many biophysical uh, physical measures that could be taken off, uh, providing biosamples, but also data coming from mobile or wearable technologies. So that was actually a pilot project using Fitbits. How is the governance at the all of us? And what are the socio-ethical legal considerations? Well, some of them at least. First, the program is built of a number of um, building blocks and across the consortium. Uh, of course, data research center and biobank so that hosted the resources, but with a number of technology centers and centers, uh, the genomic partners, those that are in charge of genotyping and whole genome sequencing, but also that provide counseling and very important educational resources. And I will say not only for participants, but also they will have information available for clinicians if the participant comes back with the results of any of the uh, DNA or genomic studies. Uh, there also a participant center for direct volunteers. Those are meaning individuals that are not necessarily affiliated or receive care under any of the healthcare provider organizations. And uh, my consortium, the Southeast Enrollment Center is one of those health provider organizations. We um, house, uh, 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 well, the lead is at the University of Miami, but our partners are Emory University in Georgia, Morehouse School of Medicine, which is a historical black university also in Georgia, and the University of Florida. 
And soon, and we are very excited to announce that we are gonna to expand to Puerto Rico. So we will be a consortium of not only uh, Florida and Georgia, but also Puerto Rico. What do we bring? Mostly diversity in ancestry, ethnic and racial backgrounds, uh, overrepresentation in our populations of Hispanics and Blacks that are not uh, Black Americans, but rather from the Caribbean, and individuals with social, um, lower socioeconomic status and education, and some from rural areas. So talking about the building blocks and the participatory nature of the research is that communication and engagement is really important in the program. Not only these participants uh, centers with the direct volunteer network of the health provider organization have community partners, community advisor board or participant advisory boards, but also in, an, an engagement list for the whole program. But also participants, as I said before, and participants ambassadors are part of this whole ecosystem of the program. Uh, there is a executive uh, CEO and a number of committees, task force, et cetera, that form this organic view the program. That way, the program and its policies, as I said, is organically uh, taking shape through our direct involvement. It's not, a, in other words, it's not a top-up approach with the CEO or the NIH or the program and say, dictate things. Rather, this in an amazing uh, set of, of blocks from the pillars for where policy, governance, and even considerations of the ethical issues uh, take place. So here where the question is, how they will lead to discover, what I want to highlight is that how the different aspects of the program and have extreme uh, uh, relevance with ethical issues that we are familiar with. Informed consent, so respect, not only respect, but promote autonomy and promote the voluntariness and the comprehension of the program and, and security measures and data protective measures for privacy, confidentiality, and return of value as, how the, as the framework for how the participants will get the information. And here I enumerate some of the bioethical principles that we are all familiar is that avoiding therapeutic misconception, overestimation, and no maleficence. Justice, reciprocity, beneficence is also one of the pillars. And present only, not only how researchers share the discoveries, but whole the ecosystem. So in terms of access to data, as I said, this is an immense resource that uh, the NIH has built. And there's different aspects of, of how this is structured. One is the, the, how the data is accessible for everybody. So it tries to be a very democratic process. There's a public data browser that contains summary statistics of participant data. Anybody can go, you can go now and, and just see the, the link here with the data browser and mine the information uh, looking at the specific details you're looking at. So from EHR data, surveys questions, physical measures, and, and this is an open access with no login required. Of course, there's other type of information of most sensitive nature, uh, and also of scientific relevance. And there's the more potential for identifiability or compromising privacy. Uh, so there's different tiers of how that this data is stratified and how it's governed. There's an access committee governing this. So the register tier and the control tier that varies in terms of whether granular or limited participant level data is available for researchers and institutions who have a sign a data use agreement. And also um, there are, the difference is the number of transformations to obfuscate an entity uh, or the potential for identifiability. Uh, cool. And we can talk more um, detail later. Uh, I wanted to give you some data too and some snapshots of how uh, the research workbench, which is how, I'm sorry, here, how you can create once you get, uh, as a researcher, get access uh, and, and give you an set of the numbers. Since the research workbench was launched um, around uh, 2020, 
it, look at the number of registered uses. So it keeps, keeps growing and soon it will be available for citizen science as well. Uh, the number of active projects and the number already over 27 publications using the data. And actually I will say, uh, yeah, more than 27 because today before coming to this meeting, I just got the good news that one of our uh, consortium publications got just got accepted. Here you can see, just as uh, you're curious about the composition of who is ac accessing the reg registered data. So of obviously for now, traditional academic research centers, we hope that with the, in the future, uh, citizen scientists and a wide variety of other entities will have access, but also it's important how this is growing in terms of minority organizations also making use of this database. Data access, but what are the conceptual models for this? With the model of preventing misuse, but at the same time building trust in this iterative, iterative pro process, education is key. Responsible content of research training have been expanded with the specific models tailored for the program with the aim of raising awareness, but setting expectations saying what the program needs from those accessing data. What are the expectations and needs of the concerns of these populations? Accountability, absolutely fundamental. It started with ID verification, but also continues with mandatory compliance with a DASA user code of conduct, also a registration and use agreement and access and use policies. There's a plethora of policies that govern these aspects. Oversight is continue and is made by created data enclave with, by data and research at data research centers, but also we have periodic audits, some random, some not, and, and publicly initiated reviews. This is conducted by the Resource Access Board, which I will explain in a minute, but also assistance. The Resource Access Board provides assistance, help, education, et cetera, to user initiated reviews to be sure that they're in compliance with the ethos and the policies of the program. The Resource Access Board uh, is an, one of the governance bodies that is in charge of operationalized decisions. Decisions about data access, uh, decisions around the resources, data access, biospecimens, and participants. It implements, it's a social implementation board, so it implements policy adopted for the, all of us. The steering committee, which is after the CEO, and oversees this, the role of the grab through the Committee for Access, Privacy, and Security. And with, I co chair, I was the initial co one of the co chair of the Resource Access Board. So if you have questions, I can tell you how fascinating this program has been in how it was delineated, how, how is implemented in real life this process of overseeing registration for authorized users uh, and provide compliance guidance, but also this process of performing periodic audits and public initiative workspace review for compliance with contractual and policy obligations. How the RAP operates in real life, as I said, some of the concerns might come from the public. Let's say you go to the research workbench, which is there's a summary of the project itself and have concerns that the proposed project violates one of the all of us policies. And, and other times a researcher is tell, decide to go to the RAP and said, is my research okay? Am I uh, given the concerns that it could be considered or perceived to be stigmatizing or in an intentional creating individual or group harms? So the RAP re review considerations, and I think you have very, uh, important, very much importance in the, when we talk about the socioethical and legal and, and policy considerations is first, the, is, has a violation occur? And this is the first step, of course, because workspace must always be a meaningful and accurate description of the research purpose that is created at the time of workplace initiation. So we are, once the, what is determined that violation have occurred, we move to see what is the type of the perceived violation? Is one of the legal, legal or regulatory nature? 
For example, is group re-identification or participant re-identifications. Others in insufficient workspace description. Uh, it relates to marketing, which is absolutely forbidding, or is related to stigmatizing research or group harm. And I will talk in, in the, the, uh, soon about it. Intentionality. The question seems easy, right? Is it reasonable to believe that the perceived violation was intentional? In practice, let me tell you that sometimes it's hard. If the, the rap have determined that the violation have occurred, the members also have to decide whether or not it's reasonable to believe that this was intentional or not. Intentional violations to all of us policies are considered grievous. And intentional violations could be more discreet. However, something very important that you see determined here is establishing a pattern of an individual's unintentional violation history. Or if there's a pattern of unintentional violations through, the, through the, the existence of the program. So, because this might indicate larger issues and the RAF have the capacity to propose remedial actions that could, to ameliorate these issues, could range for education, to um, throw in, um, putting down, closing the research workbench and the data access, but also the type of uh, sanctions for researchers and institutions. So if I move to from intentionality to, to the scale and the scope, what we hear is the RAP must estimate the scale and the scope of the violation. Both the scale and the scope can be understood as measures of relative severity of the violation. The scale concerns the size, the extent, or the degree of the violation, raising questions along the lines of how many individuals or how much information was affected the scope, on the other hand, is an estimation of the breadth, the depth, or the reach of the infringement. The questions of the scope asked are, for example, how much were the individuals or was the, considerate, the information, consideration the severity or the potential negative outcome for entities? Are they limited for participants? Are they go affected? The, has the evaluation already affected individual participants or the program? Can we anticipate future severity of the side effects, let's say, of the evaluation? We look at user history. Have the user always been in good standing with all of us or something had been happening before? What is the parent, what is the history of access to the database? Uh, what is the profile of the researchers? And then in terms of parent recognition, over time, parties in violations may appear and actually continue appearing. And this may suggest issues with one could be the behavioral practice of particular research communities, or maybe it's part of the research culture as a whole. Partners might suggest issues that in, point out that there's a need for clarity on the policy and the instructions given to the researchers but also, and, and the need for education, but also the need to probably provide uh, more severe penalties. And this is one of the main concerns of, of participants. What happens with the data and what are the implications of that? Uh, in our communities, in our consortium, uh, risks of genetic discrimination and stigmatization, let me tell you, are at the forefront. The, all of us in a prospective manner have adopted a specific policy for stigmatizing research with the research access board, as I said before, in charge of implementing. Stigmatizing research have been defined by all of us, but any research proposal or a project or a question, they have the potential to instigate or promote marginalization, discrimination, or loss of status by a person or a group of people. We are very concerned also on the community effects of the research. It also recognizes that extima is transversal to the whole life of that research project. It starts with the research design, but doesn't stop there. It's not only at the formation of research questions that could be based on prejudicial biases, but it could be a byproduct of the research findings meaning how the interpretation of those findings have been 
promoted, have been, just imagine or, or remember some of the headlines you have seen of, of some studies in, in, in press releases, but also in the popular media. Uh, are they promoting negative stereotypes? Uh, and this can be intentional or intentional. So the program recognizes that stigmatizing research based on all of us data, based on our focus on overrepresentation of population that have been historically underrepresented, abused, and taken advantage of will most likely be an impossible task, but doesn't preclude us for taking every step possible to in earnest prevent the resource to be used for these purposes. Uh, another of the major concerns in our not only for the all of us, but that we see on a daily basis in our communities, is about access to privacy and, sec and the security measures in place. So they are protected by certificates confidentiality that prevents for legal and, and, and law enforcement access to the database, albeit some very exceptions, limited exceptions. Uh, protections as that encryption and direct identifier remover, and another of the uh, a data warehouse with robots systems. Uh, and others that you might be very familiar with. And what I want to highlight here is that the All of Us is committed to safeguard the participant identity, but I said before, also be transparent if it's ever a breach of data. Policy issues. There are many, and I alluded to many of them in, in terms of telling you how the program is uh, organically takes place, takes shapes, and how the policies emerge almost on a daily basis uh, to govern this very complex project. But I want to highlight here another level of complicity when, uh, co complexity. <laughs> when we talk about policy, I want to remind you that the US has 50 states has Washington DC and it have a number of territories, including Puerto Rico that I mentioned before. So imagine a program that it has to comply with federal law, but with of course ethical and scientific standards, but also with 50 plus diverse legislation, and which is reflected in the consent process, but also in other aspects. And if I go back, I'm gonna highlight, for example, California and Florida has very strict and specific laws regarding handling of genetic data. Well, similar with GDPR, Florida tried to, uh, uh, to establish. Um, and California have a particular patient and participants bill of rights. So participatory research is all about build trust and create value. One of the tools, if I can say, put it in that way, that all of us have adopted is to embed in the governance perspective, the LC community. So there is an LC Brain Trust, which is an organization, um, I would say a group of 17 invited LC experts within the consortium. So I'm, I'm part of the LC Brain Trust, for example, and the NIH, so different committees are represented, and we always have a participant ambassador also present. That keeps us very, I would say, in tune with the real world if any of us academics, you know, try to go back to the cloud. What is the purpose of the Brain Trust? Is uh, to provide consultation and guidance on policy issues and implement, and, and implement policy. What we have done so far, and I'm uh, approaching the end of my presentation. I want to highlight, this is a, a poster actually we, we had on the American Society of Human Genetics. We have been in many uh, academic fora and trying to promote the work that all of us have been doing. And the, in particular, the LC Brain Trust. At first, we contributed to uh, the LC Brain Trust to including the new models for responsible conduct of research, but also we work on and establish a, a develop a policy for the inclusion of children in genomic research, uh, LC considerations for genome sequencing and annotations, how to evaluate the GRO process. We are working right now and we have worked now in including participants who lack capacity to participate in research, to provide consent for research. But, and we look to move forward on issues like artificial intelligence, machine learning, and return of polygenic risk score that lately have been much in the literature. 
There's many le lessons we have learned that we can talk later about the insights we can gain to that. Um, this is just a quick upshot of how the return of value, the second aspect on the program in terms of genetic information, look at the amounts of trade already received, but this is something that is very interesting for us, especially for LC scholars, 99% participants had received results, but look, and 75 or want to receive the results and, and with uptake of 75%. This is quite meaningful. And it takes me to one last point that I want to consider. And I would like to devote time maybe in the Q&A about the informed consent process. Are participants really providing competent understanding and voluntary content? One is about understanding and other aspect is motivation. Are we creating therapeutic misconception or misestimation? How is this understanding of the purpose of the study and the benefits of risks? Privacy, as I said, is another main concern. There's a number of mitigation, uh, risk mitigation strategies that I have alluded before uh, during, during my presentation that I'm just here uh, as a resource, I highlighted again, uh, but also the program is very concerned uh, as they should be of reputational risk but the loss of public trust that have in unimaginable effects in a program. So that takes me to my final remark. What is the road ahead? I think is to maintain ethical integrity and reciprocity. For that, we need an iterative process. We, we address the expectations, the needs of individuals and communities. We have to continue assessing benefits and risks, potential harms, understanding what drives uptake in the program, what drives refusals, and whether there's the decisional regrets and why. And we have to continue weighing individual and social impacts. I conclude by immense thank you to all the participants of all of us. Without them, uh, this an incredible uh, initiative could not exist and continue. And of course, the partners of the MySeq Consortium and the all of us as well. Thank you so much. Thank you, Rosie. That was brilliant. And I, I have to say, um, I think you had the best and most detailed slides of anyone in our last couple of seminar series. Mm -hmm. If everyone can just uh, mm -hmm. show their appreciation and then we will move on to some questions. Um, so the procedure is as normal. Uh, you can either um, turn your screen on and raise your hand if you want to ask a question. And, um, I will invite you to then to speak or if you prefer not to, you can type a question into the chat. Uh, so we already have a question sorry, <clears throat> from Miranda. Mm -hmm. who, uh, sadly had to leave. Um, and I have about five questions that I could ask, but I'll try not to use my chair's privilege. Um, so I will just open up Miranda's question first. So Miranda says, thank you for updating this on us on this incredibly important program. Uh, just to leave, but she has a number of questions about consent. She is both something that you know a lot about, Rosie, and is, is a recurring Helix topic. So Miranda asks, would you say that you prioritize granularity and individuals control over their data with the there in uh, quotation marks, or maybe information available for as many purposes as possible, i.e. broader consent. So I guess she's asking, uh, I, I guess, about a balance between granular control and broad consent. Yes, and, and I'm always afraid to talk about dynamic consent with the Helix audience because you are the masters of participatory and dynamic consent with Jane K uh, uh, at the firm front. Uh, so to address some of the questions, uh, and, and they're brilliant, thank you, Miranda. Would, the participants cannot be granular in terms of access to their data. When I presented the control tier, the different tiers, they cannot. Uh, that they have trust and they have given consent for sharing this information. So, and have delegated, if you wish, the checking those priorities uh, on those granular effects to the Committee for Access, Privacy, and Security. So what normally is called a data access committee. They cannot, what they can do is at any time stop their, or put on pause or withdraw their consent for sharing EHR data 
So how they retain control over their data? One is pausing participation or withdrawing participation. And in terms of, uh, is challenging to deploy dynamic consent across general populations? Yes, it's, it's complex. And I'm very grateful for the question about health literacy. Uh, I repeated a lot, return of value over representation. And the main question is that health disparities arise from underrepresentation. Health disparities arise for lack of uh, lower socioeconomic status. And whether there's not a direct, the, the literature said that there's not a direct correlation between socioeconomic status and health literacy. What is true is that communities with lower socioeconomic status tend to have lower, lower levels of health literacy. So providing meaningful consent is a formidable task. And that's why I have that slide. And at the end, sorry if I read, I, I read away, but I wanted to leave a little time for, for question and answer is the issue of are they understanding the scope of the program, but also therapeutic misestimation or estimation? I mentioned that across the consortium, we have participant community and community advisory boards. The number one concern of us that we see a level of therapeutic misconception when participants think they're gonna receive healthcare. Even the consent said, this is not healthcare. If you want the genetic information notice, you can take it to your doctor. They still think that there will be actionable genetic information. And maybe not much because it's dynamic consent, but rather because of the different, the richness of the nature of the program. The fact that the program will return actionable genetic or clinical information also affects the nature of the consent and it makes it harder to educate participants of what it means and what it doesn't mean that is probabilistic in nature. Sorry for the long response, but I wanted to connect with the other points uh, raised during the presentation. No, I mean, we've got plenty of time for questions and I think you're already starting a discussion. So uh, I see you have your hand raised if you would like to ask a question. Is that me, Michael? Sorry. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Hi. <laughs> Sorry, I think my um, headphones aren't working properly. Rosaria, that was absolutely brilliant. I just, everything that you've talked about really resonates with a lot of the stuff that we're doing. Um, of course, our sort of aid project um, is much, much more on the micro scale compared to um, your project. Um, so I have so many questions, like many people. Um, I think if I sort of pick through, I mean, you just sort of did just talk a little bit about. Um, you know, the issue, the interconnecting issues around health literacy and socioeconomic status, et cetera, et cetera. And I think we're all very aware how that certainly affects trust and sort of participation in general. So I guess my main questions are, firstly, um, if you can talk a little bit about the sort of practical approaches the project has taken to build trust in diverse communities and the communities that you're um, you know, recruiting from. Um, I know later you did uh, speak about the LC reps and the participant rep um, uh, and that work. Um, and would you consider having non-participant lay citizens to sit in these groups? So people that aren't involved in the project to also give their views. So there's lots of things, I guess, to unpack. Mm -hmm. um, what are the approaches you've taken so far? Yeah, so the approach is for, for really engaging communities, right? I think is what, what you're and how, yes. how it's really participatory and represent. It, is, it is, appears at many levels. One of them, the program ensures, even through our grant award, that the pop, our own staff should reflect the diversity of the populations we are addressing. And one of the measures we report to the all of us is how we are achieving that goal. I have never seen that in a program, to be honest. And, and it's good. So, and it doesn't mean necessarily racial or ethnic or ancestry background, but also the different levels of um, where, they, where they come from, the, uh, the different countries, they are uh, Native Americans. Uh, socioeconomic status obviously is different to achieve, but we try to represent the communities we have. We are in Florida and Georgia, just because our demographics, uh, we are quite successful in that. The other aspect is the community and participant um, boards uh, or, or committees uh, that it comes from the community itself. So we have 
what are the most representatives, right? For us, religious leaders, uh, organizations that provide uh, free healthcare and or, or immigration advice, legal advice to underprivileged communities. That's the way you, you have them. So that is very layered, right? Within the program, there is a whole task and, and leaders on community engagement. So they go directly. With, and, and also as the policies are implemented, we invite non all of us participants for consultation. Uh, uh, the resource access board, I give you an example. We got a consultation, a program that was to create an algorithm to identify gender identity or gender preferences. To, we didn't feel, we as members of the committee, we have enough um, expertise to judge that, but also our expertise could be highly theoretical. We wanted to hear from those affected. So we, invi we invited um, community leaders and the LGBT plus uh, community itself groups to come and, and, and advise us. To our surprise, uh, I will tell you some insights. The LC, most of the LC members were more concerned <laughs> about the implications of, of the research where it potentially stigmatized and it was the out algorithm, etc. cetera. Uh, the scientists have obviously more technical considerations the LGBT plus community seller told us that was brilliant. This is a brilliant approach because it means that it will really capture data that otherwise is obfuscated and will allow for self-identification because as in mine EHR records and in individuals that have um, self-represented as LGBT or might have not, but with all the data we can get. So that is, you know, how community is built. Uh, we also advertise the program widely with different means uh, to uh, address, uh, not only for recruitment, engagement and retention, but also to ensure this participation. Uh, my last slide have a big billboard. I have a picture of the highway. That is real. That is the billboard that we have. And if you turn our building and the medical school is right there. Uh, community newspapers. And so we hear from them, uh, at least we enter them, it's imperfect, of course, but we, we, we really tried at, at the different levels of the program. No, that, that's fantastic. I think it, it's sort of, it's a learning curve because I think for us, we're sort of realizing that it is a very multi-pronged, multi sort of approach that you have to take with this thing. Um, especially when you're trying to capture underserved communities overall, um, you do have to be very sensitive towards, um, you know, the, the cultural situation they're situated in. That is absolutely fascinating. If I may just ask one more question that's, that's slightly um, not related, but is sort of. Um, so you did talk about preferences of participants around data oversight and gov governance. Um, so in view of the historical abuses, uh, what did you find um, when you engage with the participants about uh, who they would like to be able to access the data or concerns um, about who may have access? Was, was that sort of captured and what did you find? Mm -hmm. Yeah, another very good that, uh, question. Yes, so they, they have expressed, so first the, the, there's communities, right? They're no monolithic. Uh, even within uh, certain communities of particular ancestries or ethnicity, for example, the Latinos like me, we are very different across different countries. So the, the concerns that they share are different. In case of the African-Americans, the black communities, HeLa cells, for example, comes a lot. I, I, I mentioned that one of our partners in, in my consortium is a school that is um, historically black. Their communities, the individuals are incredibly knowledgeable of Gila, the Gila story, and, and it comes. Um, and they're concerned whether pharma or commercial companies would not only would have access to the data, but what they would do, uh, a return of value in this regard, and compensation. Other communities, uh, immigrant communities, especially those uh, Latinas and others, express concerns over access to the data for immigration. We don't ask about immigration status. We are not, we don't capture that data. Uh, and, and their concerns are also, remember, 
there is a red coloration, color, correlation in the US and socioeconomic status and oppression and fears of, uh, of uh, police. So another of the main concerns we have in certain communities is whether law enforcement will have access to mm -hmm. the data. Uh, that is overall, I think, in a nutshell. And, and then there's the, I will say, traditional without meaning a, to be a pejorative term or a meaning term of concerns of uh, reidentification over misuse of the data um, and, and, and privacy. Brilliant. Thank you so much. Fantastic. Thanks, Rosie. So, uh, Sharmila, I think you have your hand raised. Would you do you have a question for Rosie? Yes. Hi, hi everyone. Hi, Rosario. Thank you so much for that such insightful um, uh, presentation. I didn't know about all of us, uh, so it's very interesting because I'm from Brazil. I'm I'm talking from Sao Paulo, and. Oh. We 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 write, We have been writing for since two thousand and twenty a grant to do this type of initiative that we call citizen science. We are aiming to start as a citizen science from the beginning. Um, as you can expect, we have this kind of very uh, multi ethnic approach, and it covers the entire um, well space of Brazil. Uh, we do not have an issue about uh, building trust, but I would be very interested in learning how do you create value, because I was very interested. This is something that um, we, we've been struggling with the uh, project proposal. I'm, I'm being very honest, <laughs> just because we are writing about it. It would be very good to learn how you're doing it um, in the U.S. And thanks in advance. Thank you. Yeah. So return build trust return value is almost like the moth right how to build it in the particular context of the all of us but i think it could be applicable or extrapolated in many other countries and contexts is to invite to the table those who have not been invited i, I know i have in the audience experts on uh, on engagement right and public deliberation and public so it starts with that be sure that you're very democratic if you wish to use the term and that's value in itself. And that's something recognized by the program. And not only about being more actionable for individuals, the products, the results of the research and their translational aspects, but the fact that they have a voice. Uh, we framing that having a voice is important and is value added. Then the return of value is about um, all the discoveries, again, I, I, I think I, I mentioned that before about the discoveries and, and, and by building, by closing this gap, right? And in your communities, you will have also in Brazil, in, in South America, and others, overall, if we look at the uh, genomic data, and I mentioned it before, we are underrepresented our ancestries, our ethnicities, which means that pharmacogenomic research might not be that sort of for us, or polygenic risk score. So improving the research cycle, and then return of value is on some other aspects that are more tangible for participants in terms of compensating them. Financially, we compensate very little. We give $25 one time. Uh, but the return of genomic information is, is also seen as a return of value. Uh, but also remember, this is not a genetic study or a genomic study. So information about environmental exposures, nutrition and others that participants can find it actionable that also how we conceive that we are giving something back. So it's very multidimensional. Thank you, thank you. Very insightful, thank you. <laughs> thank you, Rosie. Um, if you've got the time, I have a couple of questions to squeeze. Absolutely. Um, so I, <clears throat> My first question is sort of a follow-up to that. Obviously, you talked about the potential for kind of discriminatory research and how the you know the oversight committee can has a role to actually try and stop that. Flipping that on its head, is there potential in thinking about return of value? Is there potential, for example, to do research that would <clears throat> uh, let's say you could do some research to show that a particular community had health needs that were underserved, that for example there were higher rates of 
you know, heart disease or that certain drugs weren't working as well or certain procedures don't work as well in certain communities for, you know, for a variety of reasons. Is there potential for research to do that with a view to actually saying, you know, this thing, these things should be covered on Medicaid or Medicare that are not at the minute, in other words, for actually doing research that pushes for positive change to say, here's, you know, here's a public health need uh, that, that mm -hmm. it, even potentially through those, through this, the state, through its link to those programs has some potential to, to change. Yeah, I think that the hope is that there will be actual positive changes in, in healthcare delivery, even if it's a research project, but the data will be so rich and so grand at the same time that, that it could be. And, and that's why it's important that the study is not only a genomic study. Mm. So environmental exposure are very um, aligned with uh, socioeconomic mm. status, right? Uh, yeah. and child development, for example. One of the issues we are working at in talking about how some more specific research projects could come is access to ancillary research studies, or they will call it also uh, augmentative studies. Yeah. And, and right now, uh, the, the program is working on establish a policy and, and that. So individual researchers, even people like us, could get permission to access participants directly. Well, mediated access must be, but the point is that to recruit them for other studies. So for example, if I live in next to a factory, if I can conduct a study with participants to see levels of pollution and toxicity and link it with um, the how children's develop, right? Child development. Um, and, and so forth and so on. And actually I'm, I'm co-chairing this task and, and we are starting by building the, the ethical principle on the mind and we are moving into who should have access. It's a very complex task that we have to have, hope to have it completed by the end of this year. Okay, no, that's, I mean, that sounds really, that sounds very positive actually. And it sounds like it could potentially, you know, you were talking about building trust and obviously the, you know, sometimes the best way to build trust is to show that taking part has made a positive difference, even if, you know, if it's just showing that polluted environments have actual health consequences that, as you know, you know, then has legal consequences, there is potential to bring a civil lawsuit against polluters or things like that. So you can see how that um, is. It, I mean, is that something you're worried about? If someone, if a community used all of us data to bring uh, a civil action against a factory for polluting, are you worried that that might incur legal liability for, for all of us or for your work? I, well, I don't think for, the program, of course, have uh, looks at the reputational risk and the liability risk, but it's more about the information they return, like I would say probably the genomic information in the mm -hmm. process. I don't know about the program, but personally, I will be very happy, very satisfied if I see real action, like some tangible results for the communities. Uh, having them engaged, having at the table is important. An anecdote, for example, is that for a while we were recruiting a number of homeless individuals. Mm -hmm. uh, there is a homeless shelter very close to one of our sites and they will come. And as an ethicist, I was very concerned about informed consent and, and whether the $25 given in cash was, you know, um, coercive. Right. And the, all of us as a policy for recruiting these populations anyway, but I was concerned. And I start just sometimes stepping into the room and chatting with them when they allowed me to. Uh, and the majority were so excited to be able to, con to, to be part of society, to contribute, to be seen as a normal individual. For me, that experience was transformative and really reshaped how I see return of value, how I see participatory research. I came with my own bias, my own stereotypes. And obviously it might not be the case for every single individual for the numbers that I sent, it was like, hey, I remember one saying, hey dude, I'm here. And they gave a certificate of participation. I have this, this is a batch of honor. I am part of the biggest government program. And yeah, it might be silly for others. For me, as an ethicist, as a human being, it was transformative. 
Thank you. Uh, Pins, I see you have your hand up. You want to ask a question? Hi, thank you so much. Oh my goodness, I have to say this is absolutely mind-blowing because <laughs> I think just the scope of the project itself is just... Um, I think in, for many of us, it's also dream come true in terms of data acquisition. <laughs> I, I'm sorry to put it that particular way. Um, but yeah. also, uh, I guess just a very, you know, it's not really my area, but I'm curious to know about whether you have practical challenges. Um, because, I mean, whilst we, all of us completely recognize the absolute need to have diversity and representative data, right? Um, how have there been any sort of practical challenges in trying to balance this against, say, the very personalized nature of precision medicine and, you know, about the ta tailoring of um, treatment protocols? So you have here diverse data, representative data, data that is likely to sort of, um, you know, feed into systems that might then reduce biases, right? And then on the other hand, you have precision medicine that's uh, talking about tailoring medical treatment uh, to patients with different types of protocols. I don't know whether as a, in a practical sense, have, the, have you encountered any sort of um, uh, conflict in that particular area? Well, first it's a research project that aims to build on precision medicine. So it's not precision medicine practice itself, right? But challenges, it was not, it was really serious that that funny slide I have about this is hard and it's okay. It's extremely hard. Is I is I didn't want to paint it a rosy picture, tongue in cheek with my nickname, but it is incredibly hard to reach participants, to to gain trust, uh, to respect the diversity, even in our own staff. Recruitment our our staff is challenging. Keeping participants engaged when you only give them $25 and you ask them to donate their data forever, right? Not forever, but for 60 plus years. When you ask them to be retained to ask, answer surveys, et cetera, uh, it, it's just building the structure of the program. I said it's very organic. The policies are enacted. Uh, there are technical challenges. Uh, the, the U.S. is a very geographically diverse country. And... Or the biobank is um, in, a, in, in a winter place, I call it. Uh, so when it snows, suddenly we, we get a, um, a text that we can no longer collect more biosample for participants because we cannot ship them to the biobank or, or how long can we keep it in our fridges and then. So the, the technical hurdles are incredible and it's, it, I, I cannot pay justice of how at every single step there are challenges and even understanding communities we don't understand and building trust within us, the researchers themselves and the program. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I realize we are over time. Uh, I might squeeze in one final question and then we'll, we'll let you go. Uh-huh. Just thinking about the consent and but also about you, you were talking about the sort of therapeutic or the possible kind of misrepresentation one of the things um uh, that actually uh jusaku who's here jusaku and Kyle brothers and, and myself wrote a paper a couple of years ago about national precision medicine programs and one of the things we asked what we raised was that if you're really if people are serious about collecting more representative data data that we have at the minute is based on a very narrow population, not certainly the genomic data, but even a lot of other research data is really about from people of white European ancestry. As, as the data set gets more diverse, is that not going to change the results in terms of, especially for things like risk scores? You know, if, if it's, if, because, you know, if you're doing GWAS studies and you change the nature, nature of the data, so how does that affect your dynamic consent? Are people, can you explain to people that the results that we've given you today might not be true in, t in 10 years if we've collected a thousand or a million more genomes. Yes, um, I think, and whoever had not read the paper, please read it because it's, it's really written. Really, and I, I always use, even remember from my presentation to keep it in, in other contexts. Uh, yes, 
is part of the inform part of the continue educational component of the program to say the results might change and we hope they will change in as much that we want to make discoveries that maybe a variant of unknown significance uh, at this time is discovered to have some significance whether pathogenic or not and there are some genomic studies that have proven in certain communities that suddenly a variant that was considered no pathological or benign suddenly is patholo pathogenic. Mm -hmm. So that's what we hope it will change. The program has a number of educational materials and tools, and the, the idea is to encourage participants to access them and to truly understand that uh, it's dynamic and it's not a one-time shot and to come to us for any questions that they have. But it will be part of the challenge too. And it's one of my the, the areas I am I'm concerned about. Do they really understand that? Also that we are not providing clinical care, even if the, the results are confirmed in a clear lab. So that's you know this the standard for clinical um, results in the US, that they still will need to go to a doctor and that the doctor might run other tests, might will need to run probably other tests to con confirm whether. The, the polygenic risk score attributed or the particular variant that the disease the, the participant has. Yeah, no, it'll be it'll be interesting. I mean, yes, I wish you very good luck with that. It will be yeah. there's an interesting potential for some side studies there to kind of assess people's understanding over time. Absolutely. Uh, speaking of over time, we now are so. Okay. I would just like to, if everyone could just thank Rosie again, it's been a brilliant talk. I think it's been an excellent session uh, and I think everyone really got something from that. So thank you very much again. I'm just, I'm... Thank you for the opportunity. It's been a pleasure and, and please feel free to reach out for any questions, concerns or potential collaborative projects we can have. It's always so nice to see friends and colleagues. Bye-bye. Thank you, Rosie. Thank you. Thank Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Rosie. Bye.